Hi everyone, and welcome to our second video overview of the week. Today we're going to be looking at a problem involving polynomial interpolation. So please make sure you've had a look at pages 89 to 94 of the course notes, and note that this section actually does not appear in our e-text. So pay close attention to the examples in the notes, in the videos, and in the practice set. The question we're going to be looking at today is a very natural one. Suppose that you're working with some function y equals f of x, but you don't know the precise equation of that function. Instead, you've just got a few data points to work with that maybe you've collected through experimentation. This could be the speed of an object over various times, the profits of a firm day by day. It could represent lots of different things. But regardless of how we view the function, this is what you're trying to do. Using just this limited information, you would like to get a good idea of what your function is doing at points in between. Now with a bit of thought, you'll probably realize that this problem is impossible to answer with certainty. After all, my function could be doing all sorts of things in between these points. However, if we assume that our function is reasonably well behaved, and that the points we're given do model the general trend of the function, then we could try to approximate the function's behavior at points in between by finding a smooth curve that passes through the set of data points. So the question becomes, how do we find the equation of a nice smooth curve that fits this data? Well, we're not going to use just any old smooth curve. We're going to try to keep it as simple as possible. We'll actually use a polynomial. We're going to try to find a polynomial curve passing through these points. Now notice that if I had just two points, I could probably pass through them with a line. But a line's not going to work for three or more points in general. For three points, I might be able to use a parabola, right? A polynomial of degree two. For four points, I would likely need a cubic, a polynomial of degree three. So in general, with n points, we're going to need a polynomial of degree n minus one. So I'm going to follow the same approach as in the course notes and lead you to the general formula for this polynomial through an example. So suppose, for the sake of example, that we have four data points, 0, y naught, 1, y1, 2, y2, and 3, y3. We would like to find a cubic polynomial, y equals a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed, that passes through those four points. But how do we determine the coefficients, a, b, c, d? Well, really, all we have to work with is that the cubic is to pass through the four points. So if I take any of the four points, let's say the first one, and I plug in 0 for my x, then I should get y naught on the left-hand side. But if I plug in 0 for x, my last three terms disappear, and I just get y naught is equal to a. That's one piece of information. I do the exact same thing with the other terms, and I end up with a system of four equations with four unknowns. Now, if you know a little linear algebra, you should be able to solve this system for a, b, c, and d. However, when Sir Isaac Newton considered this problem, linear algebra had not yet been invented. So he solved it in a slightly different way. And I'm going to show you his method. Newton observed that in each row of my system, I have a single a term. So if I take differences of one equation with the equation that came before, I should be able to kill all of the a's. To see what I mean, consider the first two equations. I'm going to define delta y0 to be the difference of these two equations. It's going to be y1 minus y0. Now, if I take the second equation and subtract the first, I kill off that a term. I'm just left with b plus c plus d. Well, nothing special about the first two equations here. I could do the exact same thing with equations 2 and 3. I'll define delta y1 to be the difference y2 minus y1. The a terms will die yet again, and I should be left with b plus 3c plus 7d. Finally, I do this with my last two equations. I define delta y2 to be y3 minus y2. I kill off my a term, and I'm just left with b plus 5c plus 19d. Oh, now would you look at this? By considering these delta y terms, which by the way are called first finite differences of our system, we end up with a new system with three equations and three unknowns. It's simpler, right? Furthermore, we see there's a b in each equation in our system, which means I could probably do the exact same thing to the new system, take differences of successive equations, and kill off yet another variable. Let's go ahead and try it. 
So once again, we have our system of first finite differences. You can see that there's a B in each row, so we're going to take finite differences again and kill it off. We'll begin with a look at our first two equations. Notice that if I take the second equation and I subtract off the first, I'm really taking the difference of delta y1 and delta y0. I'm taking a difference of finite differences. So I'm going to use the notation delta squared of y0 to denote this difference. Delta y1 minus delta y0. Notice that nothing is actually being squared here. I'm just using this notation delta squared to indicate that I'm applying this difference operator twice. What I'm left with is just 2c plus 6d. Now I do the same thing for the next two equations. I look at the second finite difference, delta squared y1, which I'm going to define to be delta y2 minus delta y1. I'm left with 2c plus 12d. Just as we've expected, the b terms have disappeared, leaving us with a system of two equations in two unknowns. But why stop there? Let's do it one more time to eliminate these c terms. When I subtract this first equation from the second, I'm really taking differences of my second finite differences. So I'll call that my third finite difference. I'll define delta cubed of y0 to be delta squared of y1 minus delta squared of y0. I'm just left with 6d. Now at this point, something magical has happened. If you divide both sides of this equation by 6, then you can express d in terms of our finite differences of the y's. Right? We could write d as delta cubed y0 divided by 6. Remember that the y's here are known to us. They're the y values of our data points. So we should be able to compute what's on the right-hand side, and therefore we should be able to determine the variable d. Uh, but once you know this variable, you should be able to work back through your calculations to find the other variables. Looking at this equation, you should be able to solve for c. Looking at this equation, you should be able to then solve for b, and so on. The formulas for a, b, c, and d are not things that you should memorize, but I've included them here for completeness. Going back to the original problem at hand, if you take another look at our cubic polynomial y equals a plus bx plus cx squared plus dx cubed, and you replace these variables a, b, c, d with the expressions we just derived, you can obtain a polynomial that fits our four data points and is expressed in terms of these y values. The interpolating polynomial is given by y equals y0 plus x times the first forward difference, delta y0, plus x times x minus 1 times the second forward difference, delta squared y0 divided by 2, plus x times x minus 1 times x minus 2 times the third forward difference, delta cubed of y0 divided by 6. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Given any four data points for the x values 0, 1, 2, 3, we can find a cubic polynomial given by this expression that passes through all four. Now you may be able to see a couple patterns showing up in this equation. Using the patterns that we see, perhaps we can generalize to n points, not just four. The exact same methods that we use to find a cubic polynomial passing through four data points can be used to find a polynomial of order n passing through n plus 1 data points. The expression for this polynomial is given below. You can see that we have a constant term of y0, and then our terms begin to change in a very predictable way. We're multiplying by more x's at each stage, we take more forward differences at each stage, and we're dividing by k factorial all the way up until n factorial. Now before we use this beautiful formula in an example problem, allow me to make a couple remarks. Firstly, this formula only applies when your data points have x values 0, 1, all the way up to n. We're going to see how to generalize this when you don't have exactly these numbers, 0, 1, up to n, but that will occur in a later video. Secondly, you'll notice that our x values go all the way up to n, right? However, we never actually multiply by the term x minus n. We stop at x minus n minus 1. This term does come into play when we compute this last forward difference, but we don't actually have x minus n in our expression. 